As 1999 came to an end, many feared the Y2K apocalypse was upon us. As the clock struck 12, those people adjusted to the new reality that this prediction was wrong, and the world did not descend into tribalism, violent rage and anarchy in a quest for survival. Well that sounds like an episode of Big Brother to me. Stand by, three seconds, good luck, enjoy! <laughs> Feeling like a frost and staring at the stars It doesn't matter the cost Cause everybody wants to be famous I'm calling the shots So see you over a bar The revolutionary show that held a mirror to society and showed us at our best and our worst. The show that sparked controversy up and down the nation and around the world. It started careers, it ended careers, but it certainly changed lives and changed TV. You could even argue it changed society. For the better, in some ways. For the worse, yeah, yeah, in, in, in a lot of ways. But anyway, let's get into it. This is Big Brother. Our story starts off on Thursday the 4th of September 1997 in Holland, where all good things happen. John de Mol Productes, an independent part of the Dutch production company Endemol, were thinking of new ideas for TV shows. And they remembered, well, well many people say it was John de Mol, so maybe he was the one at the brainstorming session who, who remembered this. But nevertheless, they remembered an experiment that happened in 1991 called Biosphere 2. This experiment involved eight geezers living for two years in a massive structure designed to recreate the living conditions of Earth to test if we could one day exist on another planet by recreating Earth's conditions. And over the two years in the biosphere, the people went fucking mad. They all had fallouts, formed factions, and by the end of it, they were all thoroughly miserable. And people at Endemol thought, now that's a great fucking idea for a TV show, let's do it. So Endemol decided to do their own social experiment and make it a reality TV show where 12 contestants will be in a house for 106 days. They liked how the real world took strangers who wouldn't normally hang out with each other and put them into a house, so they did the same. They also liked the real world straight to camera confessionals, so they copied that as well. They liked how Survivor had contestants competing in tasks and deciding which contestants could be eliminated from the show. With the contestants in the Big Brother house deciding who would be nominated for eviction and then the public would decide who would be evicted. Because, you know, it's in a house. After all the other housemates were eliminated and there was one person left, they would be crowned the winner and win a cash prize. Housemates would also be set tasks in order to win prizes or increase their shopping budget, increasing the tension as a failure of this task could mean the difference between having a luxurious, really nice week with really nice food or barely eating at all. The name of the show would be Big Brother. The name was taken from the 1984 film 1984, which apparently there was a book made from as well. 
someone told me anyway. In 1984, Big Brother was the personification of the state surveillance system that watched over all the people of Oceana and sees everything that everybody does all the time. Even in the bog, the dirty perv. In the show, Big Brother would perform a similar role, an omniscient presence that would watch over all the housemates and would communicate into the house via voiceover and would govern everything that happens in the house. The main point of communication with the housemates would be via the diary room. Over the years, Big Brother would be voiced by whichever producer happened to be on shift at the time. So the show debuted on the 16th of December 1999 on Dutch TV channel Veronica. The show got massive viewing figures. Out of a population of 15 million people, Big Brother attracted on average 1 million people per show. The show was a smash. There was betrayals, a love triangle, banging. And when it was over, everyone recorded a single and it went to number one in Holland. So, you know, all in all, a good successful show. Endemol had a hit format on their hands. So now to do what everyone does when they've got a hit format, cash in. There was Big Brother Germany, Big Brother Spain. There was Big Brother USA, which debuted to 22 million viewers. And a few weeks later, Britain finally stepped in to make a version. The UK version was made by the production company Basil. Yeah, I've not heard of him either. And it was headed up by Helen Hawking and Sandy Phone. The show would be a mammoth undertaking, as they were required to make two live half-hour shows, a one-hour documentary, a one-hour-long omnibus, and three half-hour shows every week in addition to a 24-hour live feed of the house that was available via the Big Brother website. They needed to put together a massive production team that included 15 camera operators, 13 producers. All in all, they hired 200 people for the production staff. And still, my emails about work experience went unanswered. Fucking liberty. The UK version made some deviations from the original format like eliminating someone every week rather than two weeks on the Dutch version. The show was rejected by Sky. ITV thought about picking it up, but then they declined, so Channel 4 stepped in. For the house, they had to create a one-story bungalow in Bow, which was only round the corner from me. All the more reason to give me work experience back in the day, you bastards. The house was equipped with cameras everywhere, even infrared night vision Iraq war style cameras so they could film at night. The contestants were also required to be mic'd up all the time so the audience could hear everything that they did. Well I mean not when they had a shower and um, you know when they you know went for a dump they, they you know they probably might have taken them off at those times but apart from that they could hear everything the contestants did. The footage from every day was cut down to be shown in a highlights program the next day. The prize money would be 75k. The show was really keen on sticking to the idea of it being a social experiment, even having a psychologist on the show provide an analysis for what was going on in the house. But who would host the show? They chose a geezer called Davina McCall. By this point in her life, Davina McCall was in her 30s and had already lived a mad life. She'd been a drug addict, like a proper drug addict, like heroin and all that. She got clean and sober. She even went out with Eric Clapton for a while. That's a good pull there, Davina. He's a good looking man. And what he could do with those fingers. Whew. Tried a music career. She was a dancer, a cabaret performer. And at this point was a presenter who'd worked on MTV, ITV and Sky. A very affable, high energy personality with a great sense of humour and great comic timing who seemed willing to do anything. And also she had incredible cardio. I mean, I, I couldn't have moved around like that. My goodness. Oh, the abs that she had. Oh. Her life experience and her presenting experience made her the perfect person for this job as she showcased the perfect level of professionalism and compassion. Well, most of the time. And just in my opinion, probably the best presenter we've ever seen. Come on Davina, come back to host the show again, please, please. 
so now we've got the face of Big Brother. We need the voice of Big Brother. I mean, you still hear Davina's voice when she when she's doing the show, but I mean, we need the geezer who does voiceovers. The producers asked the top voiceover agencies for people to send stuff in. They were given two lines to read. One of the clients at one of the agencies that was contacted was an out-of-work actor called Marcus Bentley, who sent in his audition tape that he recorded on an £8 microphone from Dixon's. I had to send a tape off uh, to Endemol, and uh, they'd give me a few lines that, that they'd suggested. And one of the lines was, uh, Johnny's in the garden, looking after the chickens. As soon as he read the word chicken, and I can't, I can't do it, but he went chicken, and we just said, that's the one, that's the one. So now we need 10 housemates to put into the show. Keeping to the real world template, they decided to put people in the house from all walks of life, which gave a more accurate representation of the diverse world that Britain was than most other TV shows at the time. On the 24th of March 2000, a 30 minute programme was aired about the upcoming show Big Brother, with details to apply at the end of the show. 45,000 people applied. The production team whittled it down to 5,000 people, at which time they were sent a second 16 page application form. Sticking true to the remit of this being a social experiment, Brett Carr, a senior lecturer in psychotherapy at Regent's College London, was brought on to help with the selection process and help design this second application form. So who were the contestants? There was Sada, a 28-year-old cultured adventurous woman with a good music taste, I must say. There was Anna, a lesbian nut. Oh, by the way, I'm not going to mention all the contestants for every series because that would just be fucking mental. That would, that would take ages. Just, just this first series, I'm going to mention all the contestants. Anyway, there was Anna, a lesbian ex-nun. She was the sensible voice of reason, and she seemed like a really nice geezer. There was Andrew, 23, loves talking about sex. He seems like a bit of a Jack the Lad. He'd get the nickname Randy Andy. There was Caroline, 37, an extrovert who loves tea and has a bit of an annoying laugh. There was Nicola, a 29-year-old art teacher who's into art stuff and, and all of that. There was Tom, a 28-year-old sexy Irish farmer. Oh, if I was. There was Melanie, a 26-year-old computer saleswoman, quite flirtatious. There was Darren, a 23-year-old father of three, seems like a nice bloke. There was Craig, a good looking builder from the north who was going to give the £70,000 prize money to a childhood friend who needed an operation. What a geezer, the kind of bloke anyone would love to go to the pub with, or sit on their face, or both ideally, or oh, if I was. We also have one more housemate, the exact opposite to Craig, the posh sociopath Nick Bateman. However, they may have missed out on an even bigger piece of shit. To test out the show worked, they held a guinea pig version of the show using stand-ins. This would be something that they would continue to do throughout the show's run, with housemates staying in there for, for about a week or so. And for this first series, one of the housemates that was a stand-in was Katie Hopkins. I mean, how do you not pick her? I mean, you know, absolute knob, TV gold. TV gold, how do, you, how do you not pick her, how do you not do it? During her time as a guinea pig for the show, she even flashed her ass and still didn't get in. I mean, that was probably why she didn't get in, to be honest. I mean, no one wants to see that. Wasn't it bad enough seeing her in that field? Have UK farmers not suffered enough recently? Oh, fuck me. It's a beautiful morning. So on the 14th of July 2000, the 10 contestants entered the house in a very modest, understated way. There was no big limousine and paparazzi, none of that. The housemates would just go into the house with their suitcases. It was very much like they were going into a biosphere. And the show got off to a pretty good start. There were naked showers, clay penises being made, saxophones being played, accusing George Michael of being a paedophile for some reason. They almost burned down the kitchen. People were getting smashed and all kinds of bollocks was happening. 
One of the great aspects of the show was the live evictions, as the evictions would also be broadcast on the highlight show the next day, and they would be on the 24 hour feed. And if you watched it on the live eviction show, the highlight show and the live feed, you'd get a different experience of it every time. So Channel 4 was effectively getting people to watch the same bit of content twice or maybe three times. Absolute genius. And maybe an even more important innovation the show introduced. Well, I think they introduced it anyway. For the, for the purposes of this, let's, let's say they introduced it. And maybe an even more important innovation was that the show introduced audience voting. This not only opened up another revenue source for Channel 4, but it allowed audiences to truly be a part of the show and have their voices heard. And also more revenue, that's the most important thing. This would become standard practice in most reality TV shows. Series 1 went on, and it was doing, doing good numbers, but by and large, it wasn't the most exciting thing on TV. Even Marcus Bentley sounded half asleep. Outside, the boys are getting on with the weekly task. Each housemate had been allowed to bring in two books into the house, and they were also allowed to bring in a musical instrument, and they also got to watch a film. So people weren't really interacting with each other all the time, and they weren't really at each other's throats because they had stuff to entertain them. Also, the tasks that they were set weren't really the most exciting thing. Channel 4 didn't really put much of a budget into the tasks. They were sort of things that, you know, in school towards the end of the term that teachers would tell you to do so they could just have a sit down, you know, like make stuff out of clay and stuff like that, you know, it wasn't that exciting. In series one, housemates could also request sessions with a counsellor that would not be filmed. So that would relieve a lot of tension as well, and so that would deprive the audience of a lot of arguments. And as alluded to previously, Marcus Bentley was told in the voiceover just to record facts, not to editorialise. And this made for quite boring voiceover. Day 24 in the Big Brother house. Like every Sunday, they're busy finalising the weekly shopping list. The average weekly ratings hovered between 2 and 3 million, which is alright, it's pretty good, not bad. However, over time, one housemate would eventually turn the show from a social experiment to a melodrama, because Nick Bateman would bring the essential element to a successful Big Brother series, and that was the act of being a cunt. As the show went on, Nick's knobbish behaviour would shine through. Inside the house, he was coming across as a very likeable guy. In fact, everyone in the house seemed to like him. If I didn't care, I wouldn't be in here. Yeah. And if I wanted you out, I would not be in here either. So, you know, we're here to support you. <laughs> but what they didn't know, what the audience could see, was that he was purposely becoming friends with all the housemates and then talking behind their backs, turning them against each other, manipulating the housemates into voting for each other. He did it so well that he was the only housemate not to receive a single vote in the house. He would tell lies, he would do that old stolen valour business by claiming that he was in the army when he wasn't. He would even tell a story about having a dead fiancé that elicited an enormous amount of respect and emotion from the other housemates, only for it to turn out that it was absolute bollocks. I, I was very deeply in love with her. Um, she came, she met me back out in Australia, and unfortunately we had a, a terrible car accident in the Northern Territories, which uh, killed her. Oh, oh my God. So, he would speak to Big Brother and try and influence the edit of the show. He was such a psycho that even his brother Patrick had to tell him to calm down. His plan was working perfectly. The audience could see it, but no one in the house could. Big Brother instated a rule that said that housemates could not talk to each other about nominations. But Nick said fuck that, and he would write down housemates' names on pieces of paper and then he'd give them out to housemates. The names would be the people that he thought those housemates should nominate. There were a few places where Nick was able to go, like in his locker where he had some of these written things, and down in his case next to the bed at the floor, where somehow he'd managed to work out that our coverage wasn't very good. So we couldn't really see what was going on, and all he would do is go down, crouch down with someone for a sec, and be off again. Um, and we wouldn't really have been able to tell what was going on. We didn't want to call him in 
to say what were you doing because to confess that we couldn't see what he was doing was quite bad because it would make it absolutely clear to him that he could do whatever he liked in these, these spots. So no, we never saw him write anything. And then on week five, Craig would discover these notes with people's names written on them. The game was up. Craig told Big Brother what he'd found out and he was about to go and tell all the other housemates until in an act of genius, the Channel 4 producers said, do it in the morning, mate, do it in the morning. Craig said all right. It was actually a genius decision because what it meant was we were able to get our act together, cameras were in position, we could look into the whites of his eyes and their eyes and that's why it was so powerful. So the next morning all the cameras were set up for Craig to confront Nick and reveal to the rest of the house the game that he'd been playing and it was fucking brilliant. Uh, basically I'm uh, sorry I have to say it, Nick, but I'm very disappointed in yourself. Uh, I not only feel I'm quite positive and got evidence uh, that you're plotting a, pl a very dirty plan on everybody in here to vote against each other and steer it divert from you. After Craig made this revelation, all the housemates would turn against Nick, as would the nation. We've come to the following decision about how we're going to proceed. Um, it was about two weeks ago that we gave a written warning following a verbal warning yep. to the whole group about nominations and any attempts to do it. So we've decided that we're going to ask you to leave the house. This event catapulted the show into the heart of pop culture. This was like a soap opera, but it was real. The ratings doubled to about 5 million people. The show took off. Yeah. Are you watching? Are you watching? They're about to confront me, apparently. Yeah. Undoubtedly, the point at which the internet really proved itself was when Nick was kicked out. He was the most hated man in Britain, that he'd got devil's horns. It was quite a lot for a human being to take in, and he sort of veered from being very scared and upset to being like, how much money will I make? I felt like I was interviewing Genghis Khan. You know, it was like a huge, serious moment. And I'm a light entertainment presenter. What, how am I going to deliver? They replaced Nick with Claire, and the show went on, eventually being won by Craig. Over the series, there were 200 million page impressions on the Big Brother website. It became the biggest website in the UK only a week after launching and would soon become the biggest website in Europe. There were 20 million people calling for nominations. There were 7.4 million calls for the final. The show became a phenomenon, sparking debate all across the country, in living rooms, bedrooms, park benches, wherever people were, really. Yeah, yeah, well, what about Craig? You know, there's a real man of action. Uh, man of action? He looks more like action man, okay? Craig has the impression that he's the alpha male in that particular... Uh, but he does. He's the one who's lying around in his tight shorts, showing off his muscles and his six-pack. I think that's his problem. He's always first into the jacuzzi. This was the most talked-about show on TV. Well, probably apart from the news, that was, you know, probably more talked about, you know. I just see the news today, and, you know, everyone says that. But apart from that, this was the most talked about show on TV. There was a board game released about Big Brother. There was a book released about Big Brother. Even the Big Brother theme song went to number four in the UK singles charts and spent three weeks in the top ten. The show was so successful that the Big Brother furniture was auctioned off after the series, which would become a regular thing, with the Big Brother chair going for about 50 grand. I mean, I'd love to sniff Craig's seat as much as the next man, if I was, but 50 grand, that's a lot of fucking money. My word. The show also did well in the award season, picking up a TV Quick Award, a National Television Award, multiple Royal Television Society Awards, and even a fucking BAFTA. The show grabbed the British public by the balls. Maybe it was all the drama. Maybe it was the fact that they could spend night after night getting to know these contestants and form a real bond with them in a deeper way than you would TV characters. Or maybe it was the fact that the British public was now being reflected back to them every night in its rawest form through these ten housemates in Bow. Whatever it was, Big Brother was a fucking hit. 
After the show, Claire and Tom would actually become an item. They'd have a kid and they'd stay together for several years, as this show would serve as a kind of dating agency for people over the years as many romances started on the show and would last beyond it as well. But Big Brother also did some good things as well, as housemates would often find themselves new opportunities after appearing in the series they would now become celebrities. A great example is Craig, who went on to become a presenter of several shows and own his own production company. And of a Christmas single, Big Brother was now a genuine way for someone to go from being just an ordinary member of the public to being a celebrity pretty much overnight, without having any talent. Now today, that might not seem like a big deal, you know, it sort of happens all the time, you know, with TikToks, Instagram, you know, OnlyFans, unboxing videos and uh, I don't know whoever else makes much more money than hard-working geezers who put a lot of time and effort into writing editing doing research making graphics for videos like a fucking mug but anyway let's move on come on geezers like and subscribe please at the time the gossip magazine heat was in trouble but after Andrew got evicted from Big Brother they decided to put him on the cover and that sent sales through the roof. It catapulted Heat into popularity, and it set up a symbiotic relationship that Big Brother contestants would have with gossip magazines and media in general. Now, anyone who went on the show would have a vehicle to monetize that five minutes of fame, and magazines like Heat would have access to Big Brother contestants in a way that they couldn't do with any other celebrity because these contestants weren't media trained, these contestants didn't have agents and handlers. It was the perfect setup, and many people got set up over the years, I can tell you that. Now this ability to rise to fame overnight, you could argue, is one of the more negative impacts that Big Brother had on society as it diluted the value of being a celebrity, as now it's no longer primarily a recognition of someone being skilled or talented. However, at the same time, you could say it's one of the most positive impacts that Big Brother has had on society, as it gave countless opportunities to people who are often overlooked by society to turn their lives around and catapult themselves into a level of wealth that they might not have otherwise had the ability to attain. Whether it was good or bad, the barrier to celebrity had now been permanently broken down and made accessible to anyone who was willing to step through the silver doors of Big Brother. This is the most famous house in the country. It was home to the most talked about TV show of last year. In every workplace and living room and during every cab journey and tea break, there was no escaping the power of Big Brother. But if you thought all that was mad, hold on to your pants because here comes comic relief celebrity Big Brother. With the success of the show, Comic Relief wanted to get involved, so in 2001, the first Celebrity Big Brother was held for Comic Relief, and it was aired on both Channel 4 and the BBC. Everyone wanted a piece of the show. The show would only be on for eight days, with only six housemates appearing on the show, who would be comedian Jack D, actress Claire Sweeney, presenter Anthea Turner, boxing legend Chris Eubank, Keith Duffy, a singer from Boyzone, and TV personality Vanessa Feltz. Due to this not being the main series and being more of like a one-off novelty, it meant that Marcus Bentley could do the voiceovers with a more relaxed style. That is the only housemate not to have been put to public vote this week. Big Brother calls her to the diary room to find out how she is feeling since Anthea's eviction. And this would be the way he would do the voiceovers going forward. The show again would be a massive hit. Vanessa Feltz had a meltdown, started writing on a table and telling Big Brother to fuck off. Jack D tried to escape by tunnelling his way out of the house before eventually giving up and then escaping the house during Amphia Turner's eviction but eventually coming back. The Sun tried to drop leaflets into the garden containing info from the outside world and Vanessa and Chris Eubank got into arguments with each other. It was a fantastic way to see celebrities in a more candid and honest way than we'd ever seen them before. 
where the cameras were on 24-7 and there was nowhere to hide. Jack D would go on to win the series and the show achieved an average of over 5 million viewers. On some days, the viewership was over 6 million. Oh yeah, and it raised some money for charity as well. That's probably uh, more important. But still, the show was a runaway steam train. And a few months later, Season 2 started. Season 2 took what worked on Season 1 and polished it. Big Brother got their iconic eye logo that they would use going forward. This time they gave the house a theme, which would be Cabin Fever. And they did what anyone does when they have success with something. They squeezed it for all it was fucking worth. As now, the live feeds were accessible on Channel 4 using the red button. They added not one, but two spin-off shows. A catch-up show called Big Brother Reveals More and Big Brother's Little Brother, a magazine show hosted by the lovely Dermot O'Leary. Oh, if I was. These spin-off shows would not only allow the Channel 4 network to just spam all of its schedule with, with Big Brother content and, you know, not have to think of new ideas, I'll just stick more Big Brother on, but would also serve as a good gig for former Big Brother housemates who would now have a career to go into and provide a much longer shelf life for these contestants, keeping them in the public consciousness. Series 2 of the show was also a hit achieving similar ratings to Series 1, as flight attendant Brian Dowling went on to win, endearing himself to the nation. Second place Welsh hairdresser Helen also became a fan favourite, as she got into a budding romance with fellow housemate Paul. So you know, that's nice. I mean, she did have a boyfriend at the time, but eh, forget that, forget that. Over the series, they'd achieve 16 million votes, earning Channel 4 and Endemol £1.36 million, and generating over £800,000 for charity. So yeah, Big Brother, doing some good in the world as well. It's nice, it's nice. In 2002, planning permission expired for Big Brother's house in Bow, and Newham London Borough Council ordered the complex to be returned to its natural habitat, which meant that Channel 4 had to build a new Big Brother house. This new house would be built in L Street Studios in Boreham Wood. The studios that saw the filming of such legendary works such as Star Wars, 2001 A Space Odyssey, the Bohemian Rhapsody music video, and now it will play host to a geezer sticking a wine bottle up her vag. But more on that later. Now Big Brother was moving to an actual film set, it meant Big Brother could get a proper quality house. A house that was befitting of the stature of the show. And this would be the iconic Big Brother house that we all remembered. Now the show looked proper big time. Eviction nights would now look like raves with launch night being one of the hottest nights on the TV calendar. With contestants now leaving a luxury car before they walk down the aisle in front of a rabid crowd as it would add more pageantry, the Big Brother house would now get its famous stairway. Now we get that moment of quiet before a new housemate meets who he'll be spending the next few weeks with, or that moment of quiet before a housemate is finally reunited with the outside world. Being on a film set meant they could also expand the house with more hidden rooms for tasks or whatever else they wanted to do. It would also give Channel 4 more flexibility with the design of the house, with them changing the look of the house for pretty much every series, keeping the show fresh and building hype for the show as photos of the new house would be leaked in the press before the show would eventually come on air. Series 3 would see the theme of rich and poor, dividing the house into a rich section and a poor section for three weeks of the series with housemates competing in tasks to get into the rich bit. Series 3 would also see Big Brother's most famous housemate ever on the show. Well, I mean, that's debatable now, to, to, to be honest. But this is the person that you think of when you think of a Big Brother housemate. Because on the 24th of May, 
12 housemates would enter the Big Brother house, and for the first time, they'd enter live, and one of those housemates would be none other than Jade Goody. And there was 11 other geezers as well, I'm not mentioning all of them. Jade Goody was a 20-year-old dental nurse whose father was a pimp. She was raised by her disabled single mother. Jade was a ball of energy, with no airs or graces, and who openly proclaimed that she didn't think before she spoke. East Anglia? That's abroad! She entered the house, and she was fucking hated. This was the time when the Chav was seen by many as the bane of existence in British society, and Jade Goody was branded a Chav. She was seen as everything that was wrong in Britain. She was seen as dumb, vulgar, she ran around naked. She was also hammered for her looks, her weight, being called a pig by the British press and on TV by presenters like Graham Norton. Was, people would come down to Big Brother with kill the pig signs. And that was the first time I became concerned that we'd got into bed with the devil, with the, with the press, because actually here was quite a young, innocent girl. She didn't really deserve it. I was really shocked at the time of the Jade Goody, is this the most hated woman in, in Britain, that, that period. Because personally, I just thought, when she comes out, if this is the way that the, the, the press maintains their view of her, how gutting to have had those front pages. Week one saw the first time the public and the housemates would switch roles. The public would nominate housemates and the housemates would vote them out. Jade was close to going, as she was one of the two up for nomination, and she was only saved because she was up against a fucking prick called Lynn. This night, by the way, also birthed Davina's famous catchphrase. Big Brother House, this is Davina. You are live on Channel 4. Again, please do not swear. Now this series was perhaps the most volatile, as chaos ensued from the first night, with housemates playing hide and seek till 5am. The cleanliness of the house was not maintained, there were fuckloads of arguments, there was even a table spot at one point. A housemate walked out within the first week. In week 3, the rich and poor divide happened, with the people in the rich side getting almost an hour of hot water each, luxury food and lots of space, while the people in the poor side had no hot water, shite food and a cramped space. By week 3, housemate Sandy was climbing out of the house, trying to get away, and week 3 saw Jade Goody give fellow housemate PJ a blowjob under the covers, while she had a boyfriend mind you. The next day after this happened, PJ then pied her off. And this is where the public started to change its attitude towards Jade. She was starting to be treated with sympathy rather than just derision, as her openness wouldn't be seen as vulgar but would be seen as vulnerable. Whereas before some of the things that she said could come across as stupid and embarrassing, now they'd come across as endearing. She was kind of like a Jack Grealish of her time, but you know, without any of the talent. Technical, that's the word you're looking for. You might be Mr. Jolly Rogers, always having I'm a not. laugh, I'm always not. feelings, and you've had I'm your dad days, and yeah. you've had your dad days, so you are uh, being yourself. I do it, and I get all the acting, or what's the matter with me? Just being myself, or I'm playing tic tac to go somewhere from school. <laughs> I watched it and I thought, this is awful, this is really awful, but actually because we let it play out, there was a huge sway of sympathy to Jade. From being pig-faced, nationally vilified, she turned into the nation's sweetheart. And who are you voting for? Jade. You want Jade? Why? Because she's the best. Why? Because she's not a skinny girl. The 
finale would achieve a series record of over 10 million viewers, a 51% audience share, as Kate Lawler would win the show. With the success of the first Celebrity Big Brother, ITV would launch their own show, I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. And soon after that debuted, the second series of Celebrity Big Brother would take to the air on the 20th of November. Channel 4 would continue with Celebrity Big Brother, making this a regular show. And this series, it was a bit less of a hit in the ratings than the first series, but it was still great as we got candid insights into these celebrities' lives, with perhaps the most revealing being Les Dennis, who talked about his relationship with Amanda Holden that was breaking down after her affair, and we could see the painful fallout of this on live TV. Again, don't get married, geezers. Here's a reason. What, look what it does to people, mate. Don't, don't do it. If you do, get a prenup. Get a prenup. Les was a Liverpool fan as well, by the way. Deserve better, mate. Deserve better. As well as providing an insight into celebrities' lives, this show also had the ability to revive celebrities' careers and change the perception of them by the public. An example of this can be seen here with Mark Owen. Five years after being dropped from his label, six years after Take That ended, Mark Owen would win Big Brother and he would find a place in the nation's hearts as he came across as a thoroughly nice bloke. We'd fuck it up years later, but you know, Take That was back by then, and he was one of the biggest members in the group, so, so he, he, he did well out of it. The next year, it was time for Series 4 of Big Brother, and nothing fucking happened, so let's, uh, let's skip past that. Basically, they had the death knell for any reality TV show. Decency. Everyone in the house just got on, and, and pretty much nothing happened. I remember when I came in, on a Sunday morning, and I said, uh, so, you know, it's the first weekend, I said, so, what's happened? And one of the researchers turned around and went, nothing's happened. <laughs> the news had four pages to fill on Big Brother scandal and gossip, and they simply didn't have that scandal and gossip. The most interesting thing that actually happened was outside the house, as a bomb scare at L Street Studios meant a live eviction had to be cancelled, and it caused four hours of chaos in the Big Brother house. Fucking pansies. I imagine the Iraq version of Big Brother probably had this happen all the time over there. But all in all, the whole series was a bomb, as it had the lowest ratings of any Big Brother series at that point. And ratings would get even lower for the new spin-off show, Teen Big Brother The Experiment, which was a version of Big Brother where eight 18-year-olds would go into the Big Brother house for 10 days, and this would be edited down to five episodes, and the prize would be a trip round the world worth 30 grand. Yet, before doing this research, I didn't know it existed either. I don't think anyone watched this. The series drew criticism for airing two contestants having sex. There was also a bit of racism on the show, and a bit of homophobia. Or as they called it in the 2000s, Wednesday. The series couldn't even draw half the ratings that the main show would, and they never did one of these again. Thank fuck. So if Series 4 of Big Brother, the nice polite series, got low ratings, for Big Brother 5, Channel 4 said fuck it. Let's go the opposite way, and let's make Big Brother evil. Instead of selecting via videotapes, now they'd hold open auditions and pick contestants who they thought wouldn't get on. Some contestants even had pre-existing beefs before they got into the house. It's not trendy to be homophobic, but that's the way I am. I wouldn't um, tolerate any sort of sexism, any homophobia, any racism, anything like that. They wanted contestants who would create the most conflict. And we got some great housemates in this series, like Ahmed, Michelle Bass, Kitten, Nadia, fuck me, even Daniel Bryan was in it. Star power, that, my word. But my favourite housemate of this series, maybe one of my favourite housemates of all time, has to be Victor. I think I'm ultra confident. I have an extremely large penis. <laughs> it's not arrogant if you back it up. I genuinely just pull it out. I am who I am. And I want to show everybody else in the country who I am as well. I'm a born leader. Despite some of the offensive things that he would say in the house, 
He was hilarious. He must have been a massive wrestling fan as he played the role of the heel brilliantly. He schemed and game played with his mate Jason the whole time. In the diary room, he kept going on long monologues like he was cutting promos. He even had his own faction called the Jungle Cats. He was absolutely brilliant. He was out there to win and he didn't give a fuck who knew it. Now as I mentioned, the theme of this series was Big Brother Goes Evil. And what they did was they purposely engineered the house to create as much conflict as they could by raising the floor and lowering the ceilings, also making the house as garish as possible. They also put dildos on the wall for some reason, uh, I don't know. Instead of the housemates having a boy and girl bedroom, they made the housemates share a bedroom. They also introduced a siren to wake housemates up and to prevent too much day sleeping. They also gave housemates fewer luxuries. They would make the tasks as unpleasant as possible. Big Papa, you are one twisted, twisted fuck. And they would just generally fuck with the housemates. Like on day one, the housemates had to vote which housemate wouldn't get their suitcase for an entire series. Or as it's known, the Ryanair special. However, they did increase the prize money to 100,000. That's nice. Fuck no, it wasn't. As the prize money would decrease throughout the series for poor performances in tasks or any time someone was deemed to break one of Big Brother's rules. Creating even more tension. Also, do you remember that counsellor the Big Brother housemates could talk to? Got rid of them as well. And Channel 4 got their intended results as tensions were high from the start arguments sparked and ratings went through the roof. In week one, one of the housemates called Kitten staged a rebellion against Big Brother and trashed the place. When she was kicked out, she refused to leave, resulting in Big Brother lowering the prize money the longer that she refused to leave the house. Week two would get even more chaotic, with Ahmed breaking plates when he was annoyed by Big Brother's siren. There was also a food fight, and Emma and Victor got into an argument after Emma walked in on him taking a dump. However, tensions would reach a breaking point with an event known as Fight Night. <laughs> on day 15, Big Brother staged a fake eviction. All of the housemates for Emma and Michelle were evicted, however they had instead been placed in a hidden room called the Bedsit, where they could hear and watch what the other housemates would say about them. While in the Bedsit, Michelle and Emma could play pranks on their fellow housemates. After they watched Victor and Jason talking about their strategy to win, and also Victor calling Emma a racist, they decided to play a prank on Victor, making the shower cold every time that he went to use it. This would make Victor furious, who'd eventually climb up on the roof. Again, he's fucking great TV, I love Victor. They'd also hear Vanessa call Michelle a slag, so they put itching powder in Vanessa's top. Over the days of watching all their fellow housemates, Emma and Michelle were getting more and more wound up as they kept hearing housemates talk behind their backs. Then, on day 20, Emma and Michelle were returned to the house. And this was not gonna go well. What do you get if you put two scorned women back into a house full of people who have spent the last five days bitching about them? You're about to find out. To make things even worse, by this point, the house had run out of cigarettes and everyone was feeling even more tense, especially Nadia. Big Brother had thrown a Halloween party, and there was food, there was drinks, there was dildos on the wall. It was, it was, it seemed like a pleasant time, you know, it seemed like everyone was having fun. And then two heads popped through the table as Emma and Michelle re-entered the house. And soon, a pleasant surprise turned into fucking chaos. And 
as the fight ensued, Big Brother had to stop the live feed and instead show footage of the garden. However, they kept playing the audio so the viewing audience could hear everything that was going on. They eventually had to cut the feed entirely. Apparently, there was even punches being thrown which wasn't shown on camera. Viewers would call the police to ask them to check on the house. Ofcom was bombarded with complaints. David Wilson, no relation to Callum, but a criminologist who worked with Big Brother would leave the show after this. Emma was placed in the bedsit for a few days to calm the situation down and was eventually kicked off the show. There was a rumour that she received a settlement to not talk about what went on in the house. I suppose I felt bad in a way for her because we were partially responsible for that because we put her in a room and we kind of tortured her with knowledge of what her housemates thought of her and, and somebody said to me um, if you knew what your best friend said about you behind your back you wouldn't have any friends and I think that was the case in the in the bed set suddenly they could see everything that everyone was saying and it was really painful. The night that would be known as fight night would bring a lot of public scrutiny to Endemol and Channel 4. It raised the question if Big Brother had took their quest to create conflict for good TV too far. And also, where was Daniel Bryan? Where was he in all of this? He could have broken up the fight, got a few people in some German suplexes. What was happening? The rest of the series would continue to be quality. In week six, due to the housemates receiving minimum rations for failing the shopping task, the housemates staged a protest and all went silent, which provoked Big Brother to punish them by turning on the aircon to make it freezing. They'd then turn off the hot water and they'd make the bedroom and the spa out of bounds and then they'd turn on all the alarms at the same time which would result in Ahmed going mental and attacking a sculpture with a spade and Michelle nicking a diary room camera and trying to light it on fire. Things were going fucking mental and it was brilliant. As well as all the conflict, we also got a bit of love as Michelle and Stuart developed a budding romance. Well, I mean, Michelle did, Stuart didn't seem that into it, uh, which was very apparent during the wedding task. And in the wedding task is where we got the memorable moment where Michelle Bass, who was tasked with singing, completely ignored the melody of Piezu and incurred a foul, despite having an incredible voice. And after the wedding task, Victor was on form, cutting some incredible promos. The last week would see Big Brother step up the shithousery, as they gave the housemates their suitcases and told them they have an hour to pack without the housemates knowing that there wasn't an eviction that night. Big Brother then took away the suitcases, so all the housemates had to wear for the rest of the week was the clothes they were wearing and the outfit they'd saved for the final. Big Brother was just antagonising the housemates at this point, and this would pretty much set the template for how Big Brother would treat all the housemates going forward. It's sure that housemate drinks a thousand pounds will be added to the prize fund. Two shots contain salty water, two contain cod liver oil, and the remaining six contain pureed raw fish guts. However, the best moment of the whole series has to be when they all woke up to the morning alarm being Chaz and fucking Dave. <laughs> Yeah, Chaz and Dave. Now, I'm not saying Chaz and Dave were responsible for Series 5 being a hit, but, but, but yeah, they were, they definitely were. But nevertheless, the show was a hit again. It was won by Nadia, a transgender woman who didn't tell anyone that she was transgender while in the house. However, the audience knew. I mean, the housemates sort of knew as well, but you know. While transgender people still remain an underrepresented community in the world of television, back in 2004, it was even more so. Big Brother gave the opportunity for a positive representation of a transgender person to be seen by the nation. The show also gave her the ability to not just be seen as a transgender person, but to be seen for who she is, and the public loved her. She even got a number 27 UK single out of it, so, you know, good on you. After the show, 
Emma Greenwood and Michelle Bass would go on to work for Television X for a bit. Ah, that's where I've seen them before. Ah, right. Daniel Bryan would go on to become a multiple time world champion, main event WrestleMania multiple times and beat Okada in AEW. What a ledge. And Victor would go on to take a piss next to me once. Yeah, I met Victor. Seemed like a nice bloke actually. Nice bloke. The success of Big Brother 5 would set the incentive for Channel 4 to be more antagonistic towards the housemates, putting them in more uncomfortable and humiliating positions for audience entertainment. And it, and it was entertaining to be fair. However, it did create some concern with critics who said that this was just exploitation. Big Brother was back on top again, and there was such a thirst for Big Brother content that they would even have their own debate show, Big Brother's E-Forum. Channel 4 also did a televised Big Brother Panto, which ran for 12 episodes, where 10 former housemates took part in the show. They all stayed in a house and rehearsed Cinderella until the grand finale as they would perform live and the audience could vote who would play Cinderella. Celebrity Big Brother 3 would keep up the evil theme. And it also seemed to keep up with the ethos of getting housemates that wouldn't get on with one another. So stay tuned to meet a feminist icon and a man who adores big breasts. See you after the break. This series would feature the ever polarising Jermaine Greer. And the even more polarising, and a lot of the time just outright vile, John McQuirick. Who would find himself winding people up to no end. They'd also put in the actress and ex-wife of Sylvester Stallone, Bridget Nielsen. And then, five days in, they'd bring in her ex-mother-in-law, the mother of Sylvester Stallone, Jackie Stallone. Hey. Oh my God, Jackie! Yeah, Jackie. Now, the two didn't get on which, you know, as mentioned before, was probably why they uh, put them in the same house. However, over the course of the show, they actually mended their relationship. So, you know, that was nice. That was nice. However, there was enough drama to make up for it. This was also the first series where Channel 4 was actually paying the guests, which was maybe how they got the celebrities to put up with the same stuff that the main Big Brother housemates would have to go through. The winner would be Bez, because of course it would be, it's Bez, who doesn't like this geezer? It's Bez mate, it's Bez. Big Brother 6 would be another box office series, as the chaos was instant from the start, as this series had one of its best housemates, Makozi, the ultimate troll. She came in and she instantly carried the show. Right from the start, she was set a secret task from Big Brother, and right from the start, she started to get under people's skin. Almost everyone in the house was on form, in the worst ways possible. Everyone was creating drama. In the first few weeks, a bowl of spaghetti was put over someone's head. A geezer called Sam wanked in a box, allegedly. On day 29, three new housemates would enter a secret room called the Secret Garden. And these three new housemates would be Olaf, Eugene and a geezer that would be known as Kinga. Straight away after coming into the house, Kinga would talk about sticking a cucumber up her vag. Foreshadow in there. Just, uh, just wait for it. So as I just mentioned, these housemates would have to go into a secret room called the Secret Garden, which was basically meant to be like a, an emulation of like the Garden of Eden and Makozi was set a secret task where she had to communicate with these new housemates and had to do stuff like steal clothes from the other housemates and give them to the three new ones because the three new ones were, were almost naked really when they came in. The three new housemates stayed in the secret garden for a few days before Makozi had to choose two of them to enter the main house and she chose Eugene and Olaf. Week 5 would see housemates Maxwell and Saskia getting caught having sex in the bedroom while everyone was also still in the bedroom, creating quite an awkward scene. Week 6 would top that though. After winning the tasks, the housemates were gifted a formal dinner party. 
A few drinks later, and the party moved from the dining room to the jacuzzi. Clothes started to come off, and then Olaf and Makozi started getting it on. Then Makozi and Anthony started getting it on, as Anthony sucked on her tits. Then Craig got involved with Olaf. And then this is the point where Anthony and Makozi just started having it away. They started having sex right in the middle of the jacuzzi. Now the next day, they denied they had sex. However, this was contradicted by the famous quote from Makozi. Despite Makozi saying this, Anthony stuck by his claim they didn't have sex. And this moment would be a massive talking point among viewers, as debates raged over whether they actually did it or not. And as you can imagine, plenty of Ofcom complaints followed. As the weeks went by, the housemates were getting more and more worn down, especially after failing shopping task after shopping task, and having to live on one pound a day. On day 65, Orlaf had had enough and left the house, and this left the space free. Up step, Kinga. Kinga re-entered the house, and now she entered the main house, and she seemed determined to be remembered. And she would be. She would be. So it was a few days after she entered the house, and the housemates were getting on it. After creating noise in the living room, Makozi told Kinga if she's going to make noise, to do it outside. That's when Kinga took a wine bottle, and she shoved it up her vag. Yes, she shoved it up her vag. On TV. Now I don't know if that gets you more drunk to be honest, I mean if anyone's tried it, better let me know in the comments. This moment would live in infamy in British TV history, and in British culture in general really, and it would yet again spark more Ofcom complaints, giving anyone accusing Big Brother of just being trash TV plenty of ammunition. To be honest, I think the moment where uh, where one of the housemates, Maxwell, crushed up his scab and put it in someone's food, uh, I think was much worse than that, to be honest. that That's more vile, but, but still. Back in 2001, when Big Brother won its only BAFTA, it won it for innovation. And innovation would go on to be a defining characteristic of Big Brother, as the show would constantly play around with its format to keep returning viewers interested. Something that modern day reality shows can't be fucked with. Talking about you, Love Island. Talking about you. Same shit every fucking year. Twice a year, now. Fucking summer and the winter. Fuck's sake. This season saw Big Brother play around with the prize money. As one of the housemates, Eugene, not that one, went to the diary room. And he was told by Big Brother that he could steal half of the £100,000 prize money. However, what he wasn't told, and what the rest of the housemates who were watching him were told, was that if he declined, the prize money would double. Eugene only had a limited amount of time to make the decision, and he chose to take half. Because, you know, who isn't going to do that? I mean, you know, 50 grand, who, who's not taking that? Regardless, this was compelling TV putting Love Island shitty idea of right at the end, oh, you know, will, will, will they split the 50 grounds, will they or won't they, you know, the thing they do at the last minute every series, putting that to shame. Anthony would win the series, and again, the series was a massive hit. Also, this series would be where Big Brother's Big Mouth would start, and that would go on to be a hit in its own right. Uh, big Brother's Big Mouth, whatever, it's on E4, and it's, uh, they have experts on, uh, sociologists, uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, and they provide um, expert insight into and expert analysis of the phenomena of some twats in a place. <laughs> Just as a prior spin-off show had helped Dermot O'Leary's career, Big Brother's Big Mouth helped to make Russell Brand into a household name. And that might not have turned out to be such a good thing. Uh, I mean, you know, check out the Channel 4 documentary if you haven't seen it. Uh, I'm not going into all of that. Um, but yeah, yeah. This series would also see the first 8 out of 10 Cats Big Brother special, which was fucking great. 
It's a great concept, always quality. What would your specialist subject be on Mastermind? General knowledge, really, like... Your specialist subject would be general yeah, knowledge? that would be it. <laughs> no, that would be it. <laughs> Celebrity Big Brother aired in 2006 and ran for 23 days with 11 housemates. And fuck me, the housemates in this series was like a who's who of controversy that, you know, the Channel 4 budget could afford. There was Pete Burns, a one-hit wonder who developed an addiction to cosmetic surgery and now looked unrecognisable to what he looked like as a pop star. There was Dennis Rodman, an all-time NBA great, and a former NWO part-time great as well. He was also a party animal, who would cross-dress, dated geezers like Carmen Electra, Madonna, and he would do mad shit, like, like breaking his penis from banging too much, or having mad haircuts, or, or becoming mates with dictators. There was George Galloway, a controversial politician who was a sitting MP who got kicked out of the Labour Party. There was Jodie Marsh, a glamour model who allegedly had an affair with Frank Lampard. There was Faria Alam, who had an affair with FA Chief Executive Mark Palios and England manager Sven Goran Eriksson. But then again, who hasn't, to be fair? And then maybe the most controversial housemate, Michael Barrymore. A TV presenter and comedian who was once one of the most loved entertainers in the country until a bloke was found dead in his swimming pool during an after party. Fuck dealing with that on a hangover. They also had some like, you know, more run of the mill contestants like Tracy Bingham from Baywatch, Rula Lenska from Coronation Street, Preston from The Ordinary Boys, they had Maggot from Goldie Looking Chain, and they actually had a non celebrity. Chanel Hewton, who Big Brother put in the house with the task of convincing everyone that she was in a girl group called Candy Floss. I mean, she was also a glamour model before. So by Big Brother's standard, she sort of was a celebrity. I mean, if Jodie Marsh is in there, I don't know why Chantel's not a celebrity, but, 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 but forget that, forget that. Now for me, and probably many others, this might be the best series of Celeb Big Brother. Controversy started right from the start as George Galloway got booed coming into the house as he faced criticism for being a sitting MP entering the Big Brother house. Pete Burns brought in a jacket supposedly made from gorilla skin, which was illegal in the UK, and on day 16, police eventually had to remove the jacket from the house. It turns out it was actually made from collar bus monkey, which is also illegal, so the case went to court, but the Pete Burns didn't get done. Um, which is alright, I like Pete Burns. George Galloway might have ended his political career by pretending to be Rulalenska's cat. He would tell you he did it to make a broader political point. Others would say he did it to make an absolute ass of himself for pretending to be a cat. Also, I should mention, Jimmy Savile turned up. Yeah, yeah, he did a bit of Jim will fix it in the house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did not age well, that. I'm shattered. Thank oh, you. and all that's without Viagra. <laughs> <laughs> However, the biggest story of this series was Chantel and Preston, as they fell in love over the course of the series, capturing the hearts of the nation, despite the fact that Preston actually went into the house engaged at the time. Don't forget that, that don't matter. Chantel would win the series, and Preston and Chantel would go on to get married. For, for, for a short while anyway. Big Brother 7 would see the start of yet another fucking spin-off show, as Big Brother's Big Brain would air before the Sunday shows. Just churning out Big Brother content, I mean, Big Brother made up for a lot of Channel 4 schedule at the time. But it was a hit show, and people just wanted more of it. Including me at the time. Including me, I was hooked on Big Brother. Series 7 would see the largest number of housemates, as 22 housemates would be in the house at some point or another, as people were constantly entering and leaving, it was pretty much like a Royal Rumble edition of Big Brother. Big Brother 7 would have some of its most memorable housemates. You had Pete, a very high energy positive housemate who had Tourette's, you had Imogen Thomas, a former Miss Wells, who's she looks like that. I mean, whoa, my word. Whew. 
Yeah, anyway, you also had Nicky Graham, another geezer in the conversation for the most famous housemate ever. Nicky was a super high energy 24 year old party girl who was suffering a lifelong battle with an eating disorder. She was over the top, she was expressive, she was basically like a big kid and the nation would grow to love her. The show kicked off and Big Brother created a secret group called the Big Brotherhood, initially consisting of housemate Shabazz and Lisa, who would be the housemates to receive their suitcases and would be immune from eviction, plus whoever else they chose to also be in the Brotherhood. Tension is ramped up from the start, with housemates playing politics to try and get into the Big Brotherhood. Shabazz also basically goes to war with the rest of the housemates, perving on a fellow housemate, hiding another housemate's food, wasting the housemate's food. This basically leads him to getting ostracised from the rest of the group and getting locked in the garden by himself. He would soon leave the show, but Big Brother came under a lot of criticism, as the housemates were seen to be bullying Shabazz which led to him talking about committing suicide while still on the show. Putting vulnerable people on national TV would be something that Big Brother would actually draw a lot of criticism for in this series. However, again, it did give many people a chance to actually tell their story. So, you know, some people's eyes it might be a bad thing, some people's eyes might be a good thing. Two days after Shabazz left the show, another housemate Dawn was ejected apparently for receiving a code from the outside world, but apparently she, she wanted to leave anyway. No, I don't know, basically she's gone. So they replaced them with two new housemates, as they emerged from two boxes. I was expecting at least one of them to be Terry Funk, but nevertheless, the new housemates were Ashley and Sam, and Ashley would go on to join that list of the most memorable housemates as she was fantastic television. Sam at the time was a pre-op transgender woman. Her time on the show provides a stark reminder of people's attitudes towards transgender people at the time. Day 13 would see housemate George leave, which meant once again there was a space available. Now at the time Big Brother had a nationwide contest going with a hundred tickets being hid inside packs of Kit Kats. Whoever found the tickets could potentially be a Big Brother housemate. The winner would be decided via a lottery live on air, and a winner would be 43 year old model Susie Verico. However, as Susie entered the house, housemates started to recognise her. As it turns out, Susie had auditioned for the show several times and was a stand-in for Big Brother 5. This drew accusations that the competition was rigged. Multiple complaints to the Advertising Standards Authority were upheld, however the ultimate ruling was that the competition wasn't rigged. And this of course would be the only controversy that the Nestle company would ever have. This Kit Kat competition yet again provided another barometer of the success of the show, as it massively boosted the sales of Kit Kats, and some tickets were being sold for £900 on eBay. And Susie's husband, in fact, spent four grand on the ticket. My word. Susie came in and made an instant impact in the house. Well, for a bit, and then she sort of did nothing the rest of the time. Susie came in and she was made the golden housemate, and part of that entailed deciding who's going to be up for eviction, which she wasn't aware of. She gets called in to nominate first before Big Brother reveals that her nomination will be the only one. Susie nominates Grace and Nikki, and Nikki has an absolute meltdown, which leads to this iconic moment. She? Who is she? Who is she? Where did you find her? Nikki's antics and rants and her over the top reactions to, to pretty much everything endeared her to the nation. And this was helped even further when she got with the series favourite, Pete. Now, the tasks in this series were seen by many as especially hard and probably even cruel. 
causing a lot of criticism to be drawn from people on social media. The soap task for me looked particularly painful. Also, the task where the housemates were locked in the garden in the blazing sun for five hours should get a mention because it provoked this reaction from Nikki. <laughs> Big Brother also did things like have housemates dance for hours during a task, then only gave the winner a small trophy. And then there was the time that housemates had to do a step count task for the meal of their choice, and then when the winner won the task, Big Brother made the meal inedible. Again, Big Brother just fucking with people at this point for people's amusement. I mean, sometimes it was quite amusing to be fair, but, but still, nasty stuff. This season would see one of the best eviction twists I've ever seen. In week 6, Ashley would be evicted, but after she said goodbye to her fellow housemates, she was shown into a secret room, where she was met with four new housemates. Over the next few days, Ashley would have to evict three of those housemates, but what Big Brother didn't tell her was that the housemates she evicted were actually going to the main Big Brother house. And now, with one housemate left, Ashley had to make an actual real eviction. This caused her to evict Jonathan, the one housemate from the secret garden left that she actually wanted to save and actually wanted to be in the house. On top of that, Ashley would then have to go to the main house and face the housemates that she evicted. Big brother, you mean bastards. As I say, Big Brother just liked to fuck with housemates, like the time when Jane broke the rules and all the housemates were up for eviction. Or on week 8, when Nikki was evicted, leaving Pete devastated, and then the next morning, Big Brother playing a clip of Nikki screaming as the alarm, which briefly made Pete think that she was in the house. Oh, never mind, a few weeks later she is. As this series, the public could vote for four housemates to enter the house next door. Then after three days, the housemates from the main house could choose one housemate from the house next door to rejoin them. And Nikki returned. Now this attracted even more controversy to the show, as the British public had spent their hard-earned money to evict Nikki, and it seemed like it was all just being pissed away. Channel 4 received 500 complaints, Ofcom received 1000 complaints, the ICSTIS, the, the phone version of Ofcom basically, received 2500 complaints, and Big Brother had to pay a 50 grand fine, and they also gave away the money from voting to charity. Not a good look for the show. That's the one unspoken rule between producers and public. You get to choose who stays in and who doesn't. So the fact that when she went back in, that, that, that unwritten rule was kind of broken. For some people, it isn't just a call. You know, some people it's 20 calls. So I, I completely get that, that you'd be very annoyed that, you know, you spent 10 quid on trying to get Nikki out. And then what do we do? We go and chuck her back in again. Pete would go on to win the show and raise a lot of awareness for Tourette's. And he seems like a lovely geezer, Pete. You know, I hope you're doing well. I hope you're doing well. Despite the fan backlash, this series was voted the best series of Big Brother in a 2010 poll, and it holds a strong place in a lot of viewers' hearts. This, you could say, was the height of Big Brother. Big Brother truly was at the top of the TV world. But what goes up must come down. Celebrity Big Brother 5